Hi, this is Emerald and welcome to the Diamond Net. And today I'm going to be talking to you about the importance of creating a working morality structure while seeking enlightenment. So if we look at the religions of old, most particularly monotheistic religions, we'll notice that morality is a huge part of those religions. You know, there are certain things that are sins that should not be done, and then there are other things that are virtues that should be done. Um, and if you are a person who is on the path seeking enlightenment and you're familiar with the idea of non-duality, you'll know that um, the idea of right and wrong is kind of a false dichotomy that people sort of project onto reality. Um, and as such can actually be a hindrance to seeing what's there beyond appearances, which is a huge part of being on the path of kind of unlearning non-truth. And so if we look at these religions and really think that, okay, well, if religions are supposed to be a way to get you on the path and get you closer to God, why is it that these particular religions are so focused on morality when it can be such a hindrance um, and something that might throw someone off? And my thought on this is this, is that, well, most religions were essentially created by a sage. And a sage is somebody who would have transcended the ego and would have that direct connection with God and would feel a sense of oneness with everyone and would have the ability to love unconditionally. And they would probably also recognize the fact that, you know, trying to communicate these insights, these higher wisdom insights to people who basically have to toil in the field all day who are maybe undereducated and don't really have the same uh, conceptual awareness that us modern people have, that it becomes very difficult to communicate those higher truths to people. You know, and essentially that's why there's a lot of morality stories in the Bible that are basically written in esoteric uh, language. Or, you know, the same can be said of the Kabbalah, the Quran, any of those monotheistic religions have these kind of um, allegorical ideas and not just the monotheistic ones either but more so I'm focusing on that because the focus there is on what you should be doing and what you should not be doing and so probably in realizing the difficulty of communicating those kinds of ideas that would help people become seekers on the path and realizing that the people really wouldn't have the time or the education to really do that you know, they probably thought, well, what is it that I can give these people that's going to be of benefit to them, that's going to make their society run more harmoniously, that's going to alleviate suffering in general? And they probably looked around and they saw that those societies had some barbaric practices. You know, so for example, just being like hyper punitive for um, any kind of transgression, like for example, like a thief might be like hung or burned or the stake or something like that, you know. So where it's really cruel and unusual punishment and probably eye for an eye was probably the way uh, things were done. And so essentially they wanted to say like, okay, well, what can I do to alleviate that? And so they created basically moral rules for everyone to follow um, to make um, the society as it was run in a more harmonious way you know, that kind of um, eliminated certain types of social decay that could have been seen at the time in that particular society. And this is why the morals of those religions seem very um, area and time period specific. But ultimately, out of all of the religions, not just um, the monotheistic ones, you know, there is one moral rule that's kind of like the general rule of thumb uh, for how you should conduct your behavior. Um, and that idea is the golden rule, to do unto others as you would have others do unto you. And I think that this rule is made specifically in response to the idea that an eye for an eye is okay. And a lot of people sort of intuitively think that, oh, well, of course that makes sense. If somebody does something bad to me, I'm going to do something bad back to them. But if you're in if you are a sage and you are in the state of non-duality and you feel that oneness and that connection with all other things you'll recognize that an eye for an eye would really be like your your right hand stabbing your left hand you know it, basically you're hurting yourself by hurting other people and noticing that the people who you unconditionally love are doing the same kind of thing to themselves 
they're they're hurting themselves without realizing it because they don't realize that they are truly not separate from all other things in reality. Now I think that many of us modern folks might look uh, back at these like strict uh, moral rules of like definite rights and definite wrongs and say, well, whoa, you know, that's a bit intense, you know, why, why was it that way? That's a little bit backwards. But I think that, you know, us as modern people don't realize that the foundations of our society has really grown out of that. You know, and that perhaps that these were the things that really brought us forward in terms of being more compassionate and being more understanding, even if we can look at them as a little bit outmoded and outdated. Now that said, there are a lot of rules within the monotheistic religion specifically where if you get really into the weeds with those rules and you start taking them very seriously, you know, the ego really loves to latch on to those things and so they can become a hindrance to actually seeking enlightenment and being able to let go. And this is why I think it's best to keep your morality structure as simple and streamlined as possible. And that's why I think the golden rule is a good morality structure to adopt because essentially what you do is you, you're kind of like, okay, I'm going to do unto others as I would have others do unto me. And this is a very flexible one rule morality structure that you can use in any kind of situation. But the main reason why I think that this is important to do is that you want to make sure that as you are seeking on the path that you have a routine of doing positive things, things that are going to alleviate suffering for yourself and others, and things that are going to basically be conducive to social harmony and harmony in your family and harmony in all of your relationships. You know, and the golden rule is a good way to do that um, because you know, as you are basically unlearning non-truth and as you are going further down the path and getting more uh, disidentified with your self-concept, most people have motivations that run directly through their self-concept. So they do positive things because they want to be a good person, not just to be doing positive things, but because they want their ego to be a certain way and they want to see themselves a certain way. And, you know, this is quite natural for someone who's ego identified, but as you slowly become more and more disidentified with that ego structure, you know, you might lose your motivation to do positive things or to be a good person. And you might just think, well, you know, if, if these types of things aren't really inherent to reality, and if I don't really care about being a good person because I'm not a me in the first place, then what's to stop me from just doing anything that I want? You know, I might as well go ahead and do those things. And this is, um, this is basically the concept of Zen devilry, where a person has basically transcended um, the things that have like motivated themselves to be a good person. And so I think it's very important that while you're seeking, that when you're in that middle ground where you're not feeling really that connection and that oneness and that unconditional love that might motivate you to do positive things, but you're also not highly identified with ego, it's important in that middle stage to have routines of doing positive things and, you know, just generally being a force of good in the universe. And I think that the golden rule will really help you do that. Just put it on in your back pocket as a tool. Make sure that you have a good practice of being conscientious, making sure that other people are comfortable. Make sure that you give yourself the same benefits of that treatment. You know, make sure that you have self-respect. Make sure you have respect for others. These types of things are very important. That said, morality has nothing to do with truth or enlightenment at all. You know, essentially, you can be doing as many good things that you've decided are good and as many, like, in minimizing as many bad things, that's not going to bring you closer to enlightenment because enlightenment has to do with unlearning non-truth. Also, morality tends to be quite mechanical like because it doesn't always work in every scenario. So it doesn't work like wisdom where it like is kind of um, time sensitive, situation sensitive. Morality is basically like you have this these set of rigid principles and you want it to work in every single situation. It doesn't necessarily do that. Morality is relativistic. 
you know so anybody can decide that anything is good or bad or that anything is right or wrong it's purely subjective now generally speaking you know we do have things that are considered bad or good across cultures because certain things are healthy or unhealthy but there is no inherent right or wrong to reality and so our morality structure if it's not simple and streamlined it can really get in the way of our ability to see what's real out here and what's actually inherent to reality so my advice is to keep your morality structure simple and very very flexible to where it can be applied to many different situations that way it doesn't become mechanical a lot of times morality can become quite mechanical if you have a huge list of moral rules because they are not really time or situation sensitive you know and you're trying to basically sometimes fit square pegs into round holes another point of advice is to be as detached from your morality structure as you can in terms of your identity so don't identify with your morality structure don't think oh I have this morality structure and that makes me a good person and I'm awesome yay you know the main thing is you're thinking about your morality structure as a tool to have in your tool belt that you can pick up and put down and that you know it is doesn't really have anything to do with you it's just a practice it's just a routine that you're doing it's something that's going to be a benefit for you in most situations that you can pull out whenever you need it you could put it back whenever you don't need it all right my third bit of advice would be to base your uh, morality structure um, on the golden rule of doing unto others as you would want them to do unto you now this can be a little bit tricky it's not perfect by any means um, you know because sometimes other people don't want the same things as we want and so you have to kind of be able to empathize with them a bit and then you can find you know what might be the most appropriate action that's going to be the best for everybody um, involved now my fourth bit of advice is to remember that morality structure is 100 percent relative um, I had once had a, dis a subscriber of mine describe it as uh, building castles in the sky. So essentially, you know, morality structures are based on a premise of, oh, this is a good thing. And then basically you have a lot of other structures stacked on top of that. But as you go down further and further, you realize that there's no actual thing for it to rest on. Because like I said, right and wrong is not inherently an aspect of reality and so you have to have a premise for what you decide is right or wrong in the first place and then all of your other ideas are kind of stacked on top of that so it's important to remember that because other people will likely have different morals than you and you know if you see that somebody has different morals and you've decided these are the morals I'm going to go with it might become a bit of a judgment consciously or unconsciously on your part and you say oh well that person is an immoral person shame on them and yay for me I'm awesome because I have this kind of morality which also comes back to my second bit of advice to not identify so strongly with your morality structure and also keep in mind like I said before that most of what's probably keeping you acting in a moral way or acting in a positive way comes from your ego so as you are seeking enlightenment and as you are transcending your ego and as you're like unlearning untruth you know you might lose motivation to actually have a positive um, impact or you might fall into a trap where you think that oh well negative action is just fine I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna do whatever it is that I want because essentially all of this is meaningless because it's you know it's all non-dual and this and that and there's no right or wrong you know so as you're seeking you know you might um, be tempted to succumb to Zen devilry and so it's very very important to keep this um, this practice of doing positive things with you and to have that in your tool belt and to um, continue to practice it because it's a valuable thing to practice another reason is because we might uh, think uh, we might realize that we're acting in a benevolent way but for a selfish reason you know a lot of people realize it's like oh I really want to help people but maybe I just want to help people because it might make uh, me feel better about myself and have a stronger ego so the main thing is to be able to put these concerns aside and still continue to practice that as just a practice you know it isn't about you know whether you're a good person or not you know that's an identity concern that's an ego concern more so it is about realizing 
that everything is connected, all is one thing. And essentially, if you do positive things for other people, you're doing positive things for yourself. So even if your benevolent action is completely self-motivated, you know, well, everything is always going to be self-motivated because everything is yourself. So if you want to do a positive thing for yourself, then do positive things for other people and do positive things for yourself. And following that bit of advice that I had about not necessarily um, identifying with your morality structure and not really worrying about being a good person or a bad person or what or what your label is, you know, you can then uh, start to actually focus on doing positive things for people just as a practice because you know that they're part of yourself. So I also recommend developing a loving kindness practice, you know, making sure that you're trying to put yourself in that mind space of unconditional love, even in just a theoretical way, you know, even if you're not quite there to where you can feel it. But also keep in mind that all of these practices are just that. They are just practices. They're tools to have in your tool bed. They're not something to identify with. All right, that's all I have for you for now. I hope that you enjoyed this video. Um, if you did, go ahead and leave me a comment down below and subscribe. I also want to say thank you to my patrons. You guys are awesome. Um, and that's all I have for you for now. And until next time, keep becoming more you. Mm -hmm.